Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. I've got a cool new tool to try out for my lathe this week. It's called the Flexi Chuck by Eccentric Engineering. This is not a sponsored video, but he did send me this for free to try out, not for doing a video about it, just as a thank you for showing his other tools on my channel over the years, just because I love them very much. And I do like to support small businesses, especially ones that make great stuff like he does. So let's go. Here is the Flexi Chuck kit from Eccentric Engineering. Comes with all kinds of goodies in it. The gist of the system is that there are these large aluminum chunks that are machinable and they are split so they can spread apart or collapse together as needed. Then in the back, there's a threaded boss and then a taper on the inside. Then on the chuck body itself, which is this little hardened steel assembly here, there's a taper on the end of that which is driven into the taper on the back of the aluminum when you turn the chuck key. That causes those four blocks to expand and grab whatever you're trying to hold from the inside out. So in a nutshell, this thing is essentially the forbidden love child of an emergency collet and a pie jaw chuck. The kit also includes this locking ring so that if you need to run the lathe in reverse for any reason or machine in any other condition which might cause the aluminum to unthread, that's going to lock that in place on the chuck body. The system does also work for external work holding. You simply pre-expand the chuck and then machine it and then allow the flexure spring force to collapse this guy back down again and it's going to hold your part that way. To use this thing, we need to figure out how to mount it to the lathe. It's got a recess in the back with various mounting options. One is this guy here. This is a Morse taper, comes in a couple of different tapers, and there's a drawbar thread in there as well. So that could theoretically be mounted directly in the spindle nose on your lathe, or in a tailstock, or in a milling machine, various other options for that. Another option is this generic machinable cast iron backing plate. And it's got the recess already pre-ground on the front of it for holding the chuck body. And then the back of it is just a plain back for mounting to whatever your spindle nose might be. In my case, there's a couple of different ways I could use this backing plate. If you've watched this channel for a while, you know a while back I made this adapter plate to mount my chucks to my rotary table. So this boss on the front is essentially a copy of the spindle nose on my lathe because it accepts the bayonet mount on the backs of all of my chucks. One option for me then is to machine the negative of that into the back of this and make it a direct mount onto the spindle nose. I would have to recreate the bayonet bolts and everything as well. However, I think there's a simpler way. It looks like that plate is basically the inverse of the chuck backing plates on my chucks. I think that's probably the intent of this plate. I think I can probably just remove the backing plate from one of my existing chucks and mount this adapter plate directly to it and then I don't have to machine anything essentially. I would not want to do that with my three jaw however. If you've ever noticed on inexpensive lathes they always have these three zeros or something similar on the spindle for the three jaw and that's because these components are all machined and ground in situ on the spindle at the factory. That's a very cost-effective way to get a decent amount of accuracy and repeatability out of cheap three-jaw chucks, so that's why they do that. However, what that means is you never want to mess up the alignment of, of these three zeros. You want that chuck body, backing plate, and spindle nose to always be kept in this orientation. So in principle, I could remove the backing plate as long as I get it back on the chuck in the same place, but eh, the repeatability on this chuck is already not great. It's about five thousandths. Don't want to make it any worse. However, on the four jaw, it doesn't matter because you dial everything in on a four jaw every time you use it anyway, so repeatability of the backing plate, much less of a concern. So I will try stealing the backing plate off my four jaw. I am going to punch the orientation of them just in case. Again, it shouldn't matter, but it's never a bad idea to reassemble things the exact same way they came apart. Let's get this guy off of here and see if it can be used as a mounting for the flexi chuck. I don't intend to use the flexi chuck very often, so. If each time I use it, I just have to pull four bolts out of my four jaw to mount it on the lathe, that's really not a big deal. It doesn't take long at all. Ooh, time to clean out the four jaw anyway. You know I'm a model engineer. The chips are mostly brass, some cast iron, and a little bit of tool steel. That is, however, a very nice chip nest for Swarfy. 
All right, let's get this cleaned up and see if it's going to be a nice, easy mounting solution for the flexi chuck. Survey says, ooh, perfect. Yeah, that's clearly how that's intended to be used. I'm sure it's not an accident that that's a perfect fit on a generic six inch plain back chuck mounting plate. So that is definitely the way to go. All I got to do then is replicate the bolt pattern in the supplied plate. I'll measure the diameter of that bolt circle and transfer it to the plate. This doesn't have to be that accurate because the chuck mounting plate has clearance holes in it that are extremely generous. So calipers and pins is plenty accurate enough. You could also transfer punch these if you had the right size transfer punches. So I'll clamp this down and dial in the center boss. That's my best reference on the piece. I'm using my little shop made indicator spindle mount. I have a video on making this guy if you're interested. It's not as efficient as those ones where you use an indicator with a vertical face on it, but eh, it works well enough for me. The way I do it is I line up the left and right first because those are easy to see, and then I line up the front. And then once the left and right and front are all on the same number, then I check the back with an inspection mirror because the back is then just going to be a formality. If you've got the other three points on the same value, then you're centered. This being a four bolt pattern, you can of course just do plus or minus X and Y with the radius of the bolt circle. However, I actually used the bolt circle function on my DRO because that made it easy to rotate the pattern 45 degrees, which made for a much easier setup because then I could easily miss all of my clamps and blocks and such. I'm squeezing this setup in next to the vise so I don't have to disturb the vise, but that means there's limited ways I can arrange the strap clamps. Quick pro tip for you, dedicate a special chip brush to cast iron because it will immediately get filthy and everything that brush touches will also become filthy. Cast iron machines, really, really beautiful. One of my favorite things to machine. However, it releases loose graphite when you machine it, which makes everything black. The great thing though, is that that same loose graphite makes this material self lubricating. So you don't need any kind of cutting oil or anything with cast iron. And I mean, look at these chips. Look how nice this stuff drills and cuts and machines. Cast iron is absolutely wonderful stuff. And finally, I tap those holes MH for the mounting bolts that are on the back of my four jaw chuck. Since I'm all set up here with the DRO bolt circle function and everything, I might as well run around these holes with the chamfering tool as well. Normally for just four holes like this, I'd chamfer them by hand, but eh, I'm all set up and machine chamfers do look nice. I'll I still have to chamfer the backs of these by hand, of course, because I'll lose my setup, but that's fine. In theory, then, that should be it. After a grueling 10 minutes of hard machine shop work, that should be our backing plate ready to install on the lathe. Amazingly, the bolts that were used to mount this to my forge are even the correct length. When does that ever happen? So I don't even have to get new bolts. Another way to do this, of course, would be to order a new backing plate for this specific chuck. Precision Matthews does sell these backing plates, so you can buy them, although for my entire machining life, they've been back ordered, so I don't know if you can actually buy them, but they do list them on their website, and there's a for sale button. Last time I did something like this, I did a crap ton of research and did manage to finally figure out that the spindle nose on the Precision Matthews 1022 is basically DIN 55027C3, which is a standard popular in Russia and parts of East Asia. However, the spindle nose does not have the short taper specified in that standard. All other dimensions are identical, except that the taper just isn't there. It's a straight nose. Kind of a strange beast, and it does mean you're going to end up machining your own mounting plates for things if you want to buy new chucks for this lathe. But, eh, it's what you get for this price point. Well, with that thing all assembled, let's get it mounted up on that aforementioned weird spindle and see if it works. Here you can see the bayonet mount that is part of the DIN 55027 Type C3 standard. A nice feature on the flexi chuck is that it has these tommy bar holes and it comes with two tommy bars which are great for things like tightening the nuts on the back of the spindle mount and you can also use these tommy bar holes for tightening the aluminum blocks into place we won't be needing the optional locking ring here because of course we're turning in the normal direction so those threads are going to hold just fine 
Make sure that taper is clean, and let's get this thing installed. The nose on the chuck body is completely retracted. That's per the instructions for installing one of these aluminum blocks. And then we use the Tommy bar holes to tighten that down. Just out of curiosity, let's see what the runout actually is on the chuck body. Yeah, it's not great. That's six or seven thousandths. Let's see where that runout is actually coming from, though. I don't think it's the flexi chucks' fault. Yeah, it's about five thousandths in that backing plate. And then, yeah, here's the real culprit. Basically, all of that runout is coming from the mounting plate from my four jaw chuck, which is apparently pretty poorly made, which is not shocking considering what it cost. Yeah, again, on a four jaw chuck, really doesn't matter much. And it doesn't matter much for the flexi chuck either because it's, again, a machine in situ fixture. So it's fine. But I would like it to be as good as possible. So I did try all three positions on the bayonet mount. And I found one where the runout was quite a bit lower, just a couple of thousandths. So I'll mark this with zeros so that I can get it back into this position each time I use it. Again, not that it really matters, but you can see the run out there. For now, I put Sharpie marks on those two pieces so that I can get them back aligned with the zero on the spindle next time I reinstall this thing. I'll actually stamp those zeros once I remove this from the lathe. I'm not a huge fan of hitting my spindle bearings with a sledgehammer. All right, let's give this thing a whirl. I have this thin walled brass part that I'd like to try holding in the flexi chuck. So step one is to machine this boss down to a size that will hold it. Instructions specify that you expand the block by a quarter turn on the chuck before machining, which I guess holds everything tight and also ensures that when you machine this down to a slip fit on your part, it guarantees that the piece will be released when you collapse this. This is a flexure after all, so there is going to be some variability in the spring back of it. And so if you machine it to size slightly expanded, that guarantees that it will be smaller than that when unexpanded. I made sure to square up the shoulder and chamfer the leading edge as well to make sure that doesn't interfere with the fit. Another important step is you have to make a small undercut. In this case, I'm using a small grooving tool to ensure that the piece is not being clamped by the fillet in that aluminum shoulder that we've created. This fixture re relies on the surface area of contact being as large as possible around the sides. So you really want those square sides to be doing the holding not the little corner where the piece happens to be touching the back of the fixture. And that is a beautiful fit on there. You want that fit to be quite close so that the flexure doesn't have to expand very much, thus ensuring, again, a parallel grip inside there. Let's give it a little test whirl. So I collapse that guy, put my piece on there, and then expand it again. Of course, it'll take more than a quarter turn because it was machined with a quarter turn of expansion already on it. So a little more than a quarter turn and it starts to get tight. I don't want to overdo it, of course, because this is a thin walled part, but just a little bit of pressure and that seems really solid on there. It's encouraging. It appears to have flexied. Now let's see if it actually chucks. I've got a corner rounding tool that I'm going to be using on this. So this is an acid test of this fixture because corner rounding with a form tool like this is very high tool pressure. If this part is going to slip or fall off of there, we're about to find out. Well, I gotta say, that worked like a champ. Had no issues with that at all. That seems to have gripped extremely solidly on there. And if I pull that off of there, I don't see any signs of distortion at all. So it gripped really solidly without damaging the part, which is exactly what I was hoping for. And this fixture repeats. So I've got four of these to do. Bring in the next one, expand the fixture. Bob's your uncle. All that said, I did find the limits of this thing. On the third piece, when the tool pressure got to a certain point, it did actually slip on the jaws a little bit. Unfortunately, it doesn't really show on video, but very briefly, the part was stalling a little bit under the cutter and the flexi chuck was spinning inside it. The reason this is happening is that this particular piece is about five thousandths oversized compared to the other three. I messed up the dimension a little bit when I was making it. So this piece does not have as parallel a grip on the inside as the other three. Essentially, the flexi chuck has about the same grip range as a 5C collet. You need to be really close to final dimension on the thing that you're gripping to ensure that the grip surface inside is completely parallel to the part because it is just relying on the surface friction to hold that part. By getting a little more aggressive than I wanted to with the expansion, I was able to get this part done, but 
I was definitely right at the limit. In a pinch, also a little bit of super glue on the aluminum would also have probably made the difference to make this happen. But mainly you want to be accurate in your machining of this fixture. And the instructions are clear on that as well. They warn you that that is important. Gotta say though, that worked pretty darn perfectly. I managed to get all of my pieces done. They all came out great. And that was a very nice way to hold on to these things. Final thoughts then, I think this is a really, really neat tool. I think for model engineers who do a lot of holding on to small, delicate, and weirdly shaped things, I think this tool could be really, really useful. I can think of all kinds of use cases for it. Obviously, eventually you're gonna machine away all of the consumable aluminum part, but of course you can order more of those from Eccentric Engineering, or frankly, you could just weld or bolt your own new chunks of aluminum onto the front. As long as you preserve the thread and the taper on the base, then once the split section is getting a little bit low, just graft your own new material on the front with those split lines in it, machine it down, and you're back in business. So I think this thing is going to last a really long time, honestly, anyway, given the amount that I'll probably use it, which is not that often. It's a pretty special purpose kind of thing, just for those weird, delicate little parts like this where it's difficult to hold on to them any other way. Really cool tool. I'm excited to use it more. Watch for it on my channel. Thank you very much for watching. Thanks to my patrons for making all of this content happen, and I'll see you next time.